Today we're going to continue our, thank you for that smile over there. Yes, thumbs up. All right. Today we're going to continue our series called Simple, and we're going to talk about family. And, uh, and I can't imagine talking about family without bringing uh, the most important person in my life to the stage, my wife, Sherry O'Day. She's going to join us today. And guess what? We're not going to sit this far back. We're going to come up here because I like Just to really s- spit on people in the front row. And um, so we're going to do this. This is going to be a little bit, uh, just a, a little bit unique in that uh, I don't, you know, I don't know necessarily that this is so much as a sermon as it's going to be a conversation. And uh, so it's just a, a, a little bit, a little bit different. But uh, the first thing I need to uh, probably start with is ask, has anybody got a perfect family out there? Let me see. Perfect families. Perfect family. Justin has a perfect family. Anybody else? Perfect, perfect, uh, perfect husbands, perfect wives. Perfect kids, anybody? Okay, yeah. All right. Now, when you raise your hand, are you raising that about yourself or your spouse? Which one is that, you know? Uh, Yeah. Um, And hopefully, uh, if you're smart, you may have, you know, kind of raised your hand uh, about your your spouse. Uh, You know, Sherry and I certainly are not perfect. We've been at this for 11 years, and uh, and we're certainly not perfect. I probably give myself a C minus, and I give her an A plus. So we're probably a strong B, you know, when it comes to our family and our marriage and, and, and all of that. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we're, we're continuing in the, the series simple. We're continuing in this uh, portion of scripture out of the book of Colossians. And I do hope that you've been reading Colossians. It's a, it's a rich book uh, and there's some real important truths in it uh, and, 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 uh, for, your, for your life. Uh, and next week, we're going to uh, end our series and we have a guest speaker, Vonda Coble's coming next week to speak. And if you've, not, uh, if you've never heard heard a uh, Vonda Coble speak, you're in for a treat. So come and be a part of that, uh, that next week. But we're going to continue our series in the, in the book of Colossians. Uh, and I'm just going to read to you this morning, uh, continuing out of uh, the book of Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 15. The Bible says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, submit to yourselves to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Father, I thank you for your word. And Father, what I thank you specifically for in your word this morning is that you do give us instructions to live a healthy life, uh, individually and collectively. And uh, God, so I thank you for your word. I ask that you would uh, use your word to transform our hearts this morning and transform our lives as we talk about this very uh, important topic of family. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. Well, uh, you know, we, we've been discussing Colossians uh, throughout the series, uh, and one of the things that I've made note of multiple times is how uh, when Paul's writing this letter to the Colossian church, uh, he's, not, he's writing to the believers. He's writing to the, to the church, and, and, and what we've been saying is that, that, God, uh, that Paul, in, the, in his letters, he's really reminding them about things that really they already know. And, and this morning, I think that there's going to be some things that we touch on that you, that you probably already know. And, and, and as I look at this particular portion of scripture that we're looking at, uh, he, he lays it out pretty simple and pretty, pretty concise. He doesn't elaborate on it uh, in this particular uh, letter like he does in uh, the letter that he writes to the church at Ephesus. And so there's a chapter in the book of Ephesians that expounds on this. It's the exact same order, but Paul uh, lays it out with a little bit more detail. So we're going we're gonna to reference Ephesians today. Uh, but if you want the simple nuggets of what Paul is trying to convey to the Colossians and really for our, our lives, uh, there's four things in here when it comes to family. Uh, wives, submit to, to, submit to your husbands as it is fitting uh, in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and lay your lives down as, as Christ laid it down for, for the church. Children, obey your parents. And parents, don't embitter your children. 
And that is the simple truth. And those are some bullet points. Those are some nuggets. And if we could grab a hold of those and really activate those in our lives and understand that those are instructions for healthy living in a family context, then I believe that we can really live in such a way that we would have fruit, we would have peace in our homes. But before the, that portion of scripture, uh, uh, as, it, as it leads in, uh, the, the, the letter says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. And so Sherry assembled upon uh, some truth this week whenever she was studying this portion. Yeah, the, the scripture, when you read that, there's a lot that you skip over. You're like, yes, let Christ rule and reign. And, and you're so excited about that. And sometimes you skip that sentence, be thankful. In fact, I asked Kevin, I was like, hey, will you read verse 15 for me? And he read that first sentence. And I'm like, no, 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 keep reading. There's more in that sentence. And it says, be thankful. I love, uh, I first got stuck on that sentence when I read it in the message version. The message version says, and cultivate thankfulness, cultivate thankfulness. And, and I got stuck on that word. I was like, wow, cultivate and, and cultivate uh, the act of cultivating something. Like if I'm going to uh, plant some seeds, I need to cultivate the ground. I need to break up that hard, uh, harsh ground to make it soft and tender so that the seeds that are planted there will have space to grow and space to flourish. And I, I was realizing as, as I'm reading the scripture, when it says cultivate thankfulness, it's saying, you know, take time in your lives to break down the, the hardness, the hardness of your heart, the hardness of your mind, and sometimes even the hardness of our schedules to, <laughs> to break up that ground and become soft to make room for the seeds of thankfulness and what the growth comes from that. When I, when I dived into the word of thankfulness, I looked it up in the, the Greek and the Greek word uh, can be translated as mind your favors. And that also stuck with me and it, and it continued to stick with me as I was thinking about it throughout the week, because when you mind, <laughs> God does not show favoritism, but he does show favor in your life. And that favor is sometimes super small and sometimes it's huge. And so when I read that verse where, it, verse where it says, you know, cultivate thankfulness, mind your favor. It's saying there are small things that happen every day, small things in conversations, small things in interactions, small things in just living life. That is God's favor in your life. And don't just skip over it because it's something that we, you know, be thankful, la la la, keep going. No, stop. <laughs> And mind your favor, mind your favor with God. All of us have different upbringings and different family situations that we're brought up uh, in. And, and a lot of times, uh, I've, you know, at least for me, I, I feel that we tend to view what family should look like based on how we were raised, based on how we, uh, we grew up. Um, and Sherry and I grew up in two very different situations. You know, I grew up in a, in a, in a broken family. Uh, I grew up, my, my parents divorced when I was in, in third grade and, uh, and my mom for, for, for a small part of time, boy, she was, she was working her tail off to take care of my, my brother and me. And then she met a, a wonderful man and, and he's my current stepfather now, and he came in and helped uh, piece things together and helped to raise my, my brother and me. But our, our, our circumstances uh, were, were different. We weren't really, as, as a family, I wouldn't say that we were, you know, extremely close. You know, we kind of went to our own corners. It was that we were cordial with one another. We liked one each other, but one another. But uh, I would say that we're closer now in life than we were when we were growing up a, a, as a family. Uh, and I know that many of you have different situations in your family. Some of you may be have come from, from a broken home situation. Some of you have parents that, that stuck together and, and, and really raised you well. Sherry, your situation was different than mine. Uh, my parents have been married for 46 years next what? month. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. And uh, I grew up, we were very heavily involved in the church. It was church all the time. I'm, I'm the youngest of uh, four siblings. My mom never worked. My mom actually uh, was sick a lot of the time with migraines and other ailments. So she, she was in bed and, and wasn't able to be involved as much as she wanted to be. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of a stark difference between, <laughs> between those elements. Yeah. And so when, you know, when I would, when I would hear the, the picture of a, a Christian family or what it was supposed to look like in terms of what the word said, and then it being modeled uh, with Christians, kind of in my, in my mind, it was a bit of a fairy tale. 
I don't know if anybody has ever felt that way. Some point in life, he's like, somebody paints something to you and it's kind of like, well, <laughs> okay, you know, that's, that's the fairy tale dream that you do want to have, but, you know, in reality, that doesn't, that doesn't really happen. And, and my mom, everything about my view of family changed when I was introduced to the Meek family. And it wasn't necessarily because the Meek family was perfect, um, but I do believe that the Meek family employed these simple instructions in their life. It was the first time that I, I, I'd been a part of a, a situation or had been a part of a family where I actually sat down at the table and ate dinner together. Uh, they, they actually prayed together. Uh, you know, they actually practiced these, these, these things in, in real time. And, uh, and, I, and I started to get a view of what a, a Christian household could look like uh, when you follow the simple truths that are, that are in, in Scripture. Um, and of course, you know, and I'm speaking from my experience, you all have experiences with people that are mentors, pastors, leaders in your, in your lives. But, you know, with Ronnie and Margaret, both in, in my life, watching them and how they interacted with each other and how they talked about one another and how they worked together and how they raised their, their kids for me, because that's who mentored me in my, in my life. Uh, I, I saw that be unfolding, uh, b- before me and I began to say, okay, God, this really could be a reality. This is something that I really, I would really want to, I, I want to see in, in my life and, and for my, and my, for my family. Uh, and so, like I said, all of us have different situations. And sometimes I feel like we, we, we use the lens of how we were brought up and what we were exposed to, to say, this is, you know, this is what family must be like or must operate, operate like. God has a lot to say about what he family should be. He has a lot to say about what, what, how, a, how a husband should live and how a wife should live and how children should interact in, in the family unit. And, uh, and so, like I said, today we're going to kind of unpackage that um, a little bit. And we're going to use the, the book of Ephesians uh, as well. Uh, and Paul writes this letter. He uses the same order uh, here, but he expounds on it. We're going to start with the, the section um, that talks about, um, talks about submission. And I want to notice something here. This is found in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, if you want to follow along, starting in verse 21. It's very interesting that you think that the very first thing that we would hear is Paul addressing the wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. And we're going to talk about that in a second, but that's not actually where it starts. The first thing that says here in scripture in his letter is submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Do you know that we are to be in a position of submission to one another as we're serving one another in the Lord? We're supposed to be doing that just as brothers and sisters walking out this life, that we should be submitting to one another in love and reverence and sacrificial and a sacrificial position to one another just out of the mere reverence to, to Christ. And, and so I, I'm glad that he starts there to kind of set this foundation that when we're about to read this section and talks about submission, and we're going we're gonna to break that down just a little bit, uh, there's an understanding that this is not for just one entity or one, or one person in, in the mix here, this is really a, a, a command for everybody. Uh, this is something that we're all supposed to, to be doing. This is a heart posture that we all are to have to one, uh, for one another in reverence, uh, in reverence to Christ. But he continues in the letter, he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as you do the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, to, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, I'm not a wife, but I have a wife. And so I'm going to let my wife talk to the wives about what wives should do. <laughs> oh, there, you know, there's, um, uh, there's a lot of distaste in that word, submit to your husbands. I think throughout time, uh, that word has... <laughs> has kind of been translated as wives, you need to be a doormat so that your husbands can walk all over you. And that's where it's been interpreted and that's been interpreted completely wrong. Uh, I think when you read the word of God, you also have to understand the heart of God and the heart of God is love. The heart of God is mercy and grace. And if he is commanding you to do something, it's not because it's a curse. It's because it's a blessing in your life. He's doing that because it will bless your life. Uh, I... I believe that women have a very strong value. They, you know, in the Bible, it talks about how in the beginning, God created man in his own image, man, man and woman, he created them. He created man and he created woman in his image. There are, there are elements of a woman that a man does not possess that is in the image of God. And those, those elements are special. Those are important. And God has, 
God has blessed women so much. I mean, women are so talented, (laughs) not to be boastful. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Women are so talented in so many things. They're so capable of amazing stuff. Uh, I I say this a lot, even though this might be offensive. I'm so sorry. Uh, He's he's getting worried now. Uh, (laughs) Is that... Women, a lot of times, are better at things than men are. I'm sorry, men. Men, you are so fantastic. But a lot of times, women women can do it better. But that's not the point. It's not, women, you're not out in life. God didn't put you out to prove that you're better, to prove that you're great. You are already great when he created you. And I use the example of um, two plates. I have, I have my Walmart plate. It's white. Came from Walmart, it's, you know, from a giant package. It's probably like 50 cents if you, if you break down the cost of each of the dishes. We use this plate every single day. Every time we have lunch, we bring out these plates. Every time we have dinner, we bring out these plates. We wash, reuse them, wash, reuse them. Every day this plate is used. Then I also have this plate. This plate was handed down for me from my great-grandma Josephine. It is uh, her fine china that was given to her on her wedding day. I don't even touch this plate. (laughs) It is either boxed up or it's put on a shelf to be looked at, but it's not touched. Which plate has more value? (laughs) My, My grandmother's plate has so much more value. If this plate from Walmart falls on the ground and breaks, eh, it's okay, sweep it up. We have another one in the cupboard. But if this plate falls and breaks, it's devastating. And that, a lot of time, (laughs) that is the value of a woman. A lot of times we think, oh, we, we only have value if we have everyday use. We only have value if we're working hard and, and showing that off. But God did, not, God did not create your value in what you do. God created your value because he created you. Who you are, yeah. In who you are. And uh, it, a lot of times as a woman, I, mean, I know at least for myself, I, I desire security. I think that's something that a lot of women desire in their lives is to be secure. You know, they want to be secure financially, physically, uh, mentally, emotionally. They, they, they desire to feel, feel safe and feel secure. And a lot of times in order to grasp on to that security, we grasp on to control. We want to control the situations around us. We want to control everything that's happening so that we can find that security. And, <laughs> and that's not, that's not how God has, has called us. He has called us to submit. Now he has called all of us, like it said, to submit one to another. But I think it's even a stronger calling on women because as women and as myself, I like to, I like to take control. I'm like, oh my word, this is going to fall apart if I don't grab my hands around it like this and, and, and make it work. Um, and that's not true. He wants us to give it up. And so he places an example in our lives and everyday practice of submitting to God by submitting to our husbands. He places them over us because that worry, that, that fear that can overtake us, we can just release it and say, okay, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to listen to what you're saying. And uh, it's, it, there is, there's, it, it's important. And I, I want to encourage the women in this room. A lot of times, a lot of times we feel like we need to be this plate because uh, this plate has so much use. Uh, we, we see people who have a wide ministry, a wide ministry. It touches lots of people. And we want to be like that. We want to, we want to touch lots of lives. We want to make a, a giant impact on this world and that's okay. And sometimes God has called women to those positions. Deborah was the leader of Israel and she had a wide ministry, but a lot of times for women, it's a deep ministry. My brother explained to me that there are two types of ministry, wide and deep. You see pastors have a wide ministry. They speak to lots of people. They affect many people. But a mother, especially, has a deep ministry where you might not see on the surface the widespread of of the effects of what she's doing, but the deepness and the depths create a foundation in her ministry to her children that builds them up into a strong strong place where they can follow God. Um, and a lot of that is, is by not taking that control, by being in submission, because there's so much freedom. There's so much freedom in just submitting. And that's what God has called us to do. <laughs> and so the scripture continues, and it talks to the husbands next. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her, 
to her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one must also love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. You know, back at the fall, when the curse happened, whenever we erred and, uh, and rebelled against, the, uh, against God, uh, the Lord cursed men with having to plow the ground, having to work uh, and, uh, and it's it for our keep. And, and if you pay any attention from the fall to now, we continue in the perpetual pattern of really trying to do basically what I talked about several weeks ago with the ladder. We try to climb that ladder of success. We are, we are working. We are, we are trying to achieve. A lot of men are, are wired to be achievers and we want to be successful. We want to be respected. Uh, we do not, we want to shy away. We want to get as far away from the word failure as we can. Let me let you in on a little secret, wives, a lot of your husbands at times feel like a failure as a husband. They feel like a failure as a dad, and they don't know, maybe because of pride or not knowing how to communicate, how to communicate that to you. And so what you will find in some of the men is instead of investing the time and the energy it takes to build into their marriage or build into their family, they will take that energy and they will put it into a 40, 50, 60, 70 hour work week in an environment that they can control so that the men can come out on top and be in control of something that they can be in charge of, that they can be respected for, that they can be in control of so that they do not feel like they are a failure. And so understanding that the the mind of a man and, and how that potentially may work in various situations should equip you as wives, perhaps, to speak into your husbands and let them know that they're not a failure. Let them know about the successes that you see. Let them know that it's okay whenever they mess up. Because let me tell you, guys, we're, we're, we mess up. Do we not? Guys miss it, right? We, we do. And, and, you know, anything I can do, you can do better. <laughs> I did that yeah. purposely, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, women can do some things better than men and men can do some things better than women, but we're not trying to outshine one another. We're trying to serve one another in a position that makes the other one shine brighter than we do. Mm-hmm. But that's not innately how a man is created. Innately, a man is created to climb and be on top. Does that make sense? And so what we're asked to do through scripture here as men is we are asked to lay down our lives just like Christ laid down his life for the church. And so it is opposite of what we innately want to do. We are laying down ourselves, not so that we can shine, but so that our family can shine, so that our wife can shine, so our, our, our children can shine. The goal and the dreams that I have as an individual, the minute I get married, don't become my dreams. They become our dreams. They become what's best for my family. I, I take into consideration them first. Now, when you have a democracy, when you have three or more people, it's easy because you can vote and say whatever the majority thinks that's what we're going to go with. But when you have two people, that's kind of hard when you have opposing views, right? Well, God says somebody's going to have to make the decision and God chose the man. And so men, you do need to rise up to the task and make the decision when you're called to make the decision. And it is incumbent on the wives to walk in submission to the husband. And the way it's easy for a wife to do that with their husband is when the husband is walking in a sacrificial position of laying down his wife laying down his life for his, for his wife. Let me tell you something. There are actually three people involved in Sherry and my's marriage. Sherry, me, and the Lord. I too walk in submission. I have to follow Christ as my lead. And if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and walking in submission to him, then it's easy for her to fall into submission to me when I'm, when I'm uh, doing something. Wives, I can't tell you what it does for a husband. It does this for me. I, I well up inside and there's two different feelings that happen. The first one is just this, this feeling of appropriate pride, just like, wow, my wife trusts me. She wants to follow me. She, she believes in me. She trusts where I'm going to go. There's that part, but then there's also this part of reverent fear. I want to make the right choice because I know that she's depending on me to hear from the Lord and to follow him. I tell you, your wives will be a great barometer for you on whether or not you're stepping into what the Lord has asked you to do. 
You need to involve her in the decision making. You need to communicate with her. Let her know the big decisions. We, Sharon and I have had to make some big decisions. Having children, buying homes, uh, taking over the school at the, uh, at the school, even walking into this role as pastors. All of those decisions were not just made by me. They were made together. We spoke, we talked, we communicated, we prayed together. And when we are off kilter and there's somebody that has a different and opposing view, then the Lord has put it on the man to make the decision in in that situation. Uh, Finally, what I realize in here is the opening statement here on both in the letter to Colossians and to Ephesians isn't husbands lead your wives. It's husbands love your wives. We've been called to love our wives. The husband's call is not just to lead, but to love and to love sacrificially. So Sherry, what about situations where the husband is not laying down his life for his wife or family? What would you say to wives who have husbands or situations where the husband is not pursuing the Lord, maybe doesn't have a relationship with the Lord and is not laying down his life for his wife? I'm going to read a scripture because there's, uh, Peter talks about this. I mean, he talks about wives that have husbands that are not saved. So if they're not saved, I doubt they're making decisions for the Lord. (laughs) Straight up there. Um, It says in 1 Peter chapter 3, wives in in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. There's two things that I want to point out here. Uh, The first one is that it says the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. I think nobody understands that better than teachers. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, teaching art at the school, uh, I needed to jump in real quick. And so I put together some art lessons and I had to teach for a few weeks. And, and I'm in the class with a bunch of second graders and you have, you know, you have those ones, I don't even know what they're doing. Uh, you have those ones talking. You have this one, which every five minutes she has to stand up and do a dance break. And you're like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand why you're standing up. I don't, that doesn't make any sense. And then you have that one child who's sitting over here, who is quiet, who is paying attention and who is listening. And there is something about when everything is chaotic, when, every, when you're trying to get things done and all the kids are just off their rockers that day. And then you have that one kid who is that gentle and quiet spirit in your class. It is a beauty that is completely unfading, just like what the Bible says. And, uh, and in submission to your husband, if, if they're not following the Lord, It's that same beauty that even in the midst of chaos, you're showing them God's order by being peaceful and gentle within your situation. And the the next thing that I want to point out in this is that it's very important. It's the last sentence is, you are her daughters if you do what is right and you do not give way to fear. I think a lot of, I feel like a lot of women don't want to submit out of fear. (laughs) Fear of what might happen, what might not happen, fear of, of the unknown. They, there's just so much fear in that, but letting go of that control and just, and submitting to your husband, no matter what, even if you think his decisions are crazy, just saying, okay, I'm going to follow you anyways. And not, and not putting him down when you do it too. Like, even if he falls on his face, not saying, Oof, I told you so. No, it's saying, well, you fell down, but I'm here to help pick you up because that's a model of God. And when we submit in that way, then we are modeling God and God is able to move in miraculous ways. It makes your ministry louder and it makes it stronger. And we're certainly not advocating for abusive situations. Mm -mm. Um, If you're in an abusive situation, that's a different story, you know, Uh, but non-abusive situations, um, 
you know, really there's reward in doing your part of what the Lord has asked you to do in the marriage. I think the opposite co- on side of the coin, uh, you know, there may be a situation where the husband is proactively laying his life down to his family. And it just seems like maybe, maybe the wife is wanting control or is not uh, walking in that submissive uh, position. So what would I say to the husbands in that, in that, in that role? Uh, involve the Holy Spirit. Guys, the Holy Spirit wants to be involved in your families. He wants to be involved in your leadership. He wants to be involved in your lives. And so I would, uh, I would encourage you, um, when, even when there's not issues, involve the Holy Spirit. I think the problem comes when we walk away and say, everything's fine in the Holy Spirit. I don't need you anymore is when the problems come. But Holy Spirit, I need you in my decision making and every step of, of the way, ensuring that the court of three is together, the husband, wife, and the Lord being involved in, in the situation and love her more, pursue her harder. Give grace, you know, to the measure of grace you render, that's the measure of grace you will, you will, re- you will receive. And so I would, uh, I would say that you're not going to be able to change anybody. That's the job of the Holy Spirit to change people, even your spouse. So you'll be surprised when extraordinary things can happen in your marriage when uh, you involve the Holy Spirit, when you involve the Holy Spirit. So questions, men, have you stopped pursuing your wives? When's the last time you were in a position of pursuing your, your wife? When's the last time you looked her in the eyes and told her how beautiful she really is? When's the last time you, you took your wife in the, in the hub love of her day and what she's doing, stopped her, looked her in the eyes and planted a big fat wet kiss on her mouth? <laughs> I'm serious. When's the, when's the, when's the last time? Uh, is there spice in your marriage, guys? Because it should have started with your pursuit. Are you still pursuing or did you put a ring on it and let it go? It's time, it's time, it's, it's time to really k- keep your marriage going. Keep, keep pursuing her. She is worth it, is she not? She is worth it. When is the last time you did something unexpected? You should date your wife. Kiss your wife. Talk to your wife. Do these types of things. Listen, the doors of intimacy are not just going to fly open because you're in the mood to go there. Your wife, am I, am I saying something, women? Your wife is precious, just like you are to Christ. Just like they are to Christ. Pursue her. And ladies, wives, think about what, what was it about you that made you worth pursuing? What, there was something that, that attracted him to you. There was something about you that was different that made him want to pursue you. I want you to think about those things and, and think, have I relented on those things? Or have I continued to grow in those things and mature in those things? I mean, ladies, it wouldn't hurt to shave your legs sometimes. <laughs> Just throw them a bone, okay? <laughs> but just like how I read in scripture, it's not about making yourself beautiful. It's not about like adorning yourself to make yourself attractive in that way. The, the pursuit is also, was, was he attracted to your intellect? Was he attracted to your artistic ability? Was he attracted to your worth ethic? What was he attracted to? And are you pursuing that? Or did you let that go? Guys, your, your wives want to talk. And she wants you to talk to her. Men and uh, women are certainly created differently. You know, men don't necessarily uh, have the gift of gab. Not all men. Justin does, but not all men have the gift of gab. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, part of the sacrifice that you make in laying down your life for your, your spouse is having the ability or taking the uh, initiative or being intentional in communication. Your wives want to talk to you. Your wives want to hear about how you feel about a particular subject or what's going on. And they want you to share with what, what, what's going on inside so that they don't make up things that are not true. And so if you will open up yourself enough to be vulnerable enough with them, then they will go along with you and they will help you. They're supposed to be a helpmate, guys. They're supposed to be helping us, but they can't do that. They can't do that. They don't know how we feel. They don't know how we think. They don't know what we're thinking about with a particular, particular topic. On the other side of the coin, how are you going to lay down your life for her needs if you don't know what her needs are? 
You have to give her an opportunity to share her needs with you in order for you to know that you're laying down and sacrificing the things that need to be sacrificed. Sometimes we're working so hard, men, to sacrifice things and it's not even meeting her needs. And then we get frustrated when she doesn't appreciate the fact that you sacrificed, but she didn't need that in the first place. Well, that was all birth because you didn't communicate. You didn't talk to one another. Open the doors of communication. And women love communicating. (laughs) (laughs) Just put a bunch of women in a room and there's a lot of communicating happening. <laughs> but, you know, in that, at wives, it's important because your, your husband is worth your respect and he is worth you honoring him. And that comes in conversation. When you're with your friends, that is not a space to, to release all of the frustrations that you have about your spouse. I mean, there's, there is professional counseling for that. There is a spiritual mentorship for those sort of things. But going to your friends and basically kind of like bad-mouthing your husband uh, to them just to get it off your chest is not honoring him. It's not respecting him. And that's not what you've been called to do. And so, you know, as much as we love talking, <laughs> be careful with your words because it, like the Bible says, your tongue has, has the ability to give life and it also has the ability to give death. And you don't want that. You want life in your relationship. So birth that with what you say, not just when he's around, but also when he's gone. I want, I want people to know not all the teeny tiny little frustrations that I have, because we all have those. We all have the little pet peeves that might get on our nerves, but those aren't what matters. What matters is I want people to know how incredible Kevin is, how amazing he is, and how much I love him, and that how much I want to be by his side uh, no matter what happens, no matter how dark things get, I'm going to stand by his side. And that's what I want people to know about our relationship not the pet peeves. <laughs> it's interesting. It's exactly what Christ does for us. He, when he looks at us, he illuminates those things in us that are good, that are pleasant because all the garbage has been covered, right? So all of the things that are good, those things come to the surface in that uh, how we treat each other and especially the people that we say we love the most. Mm-hmm. Finally, uh, men, there's not, one, there's not only one person who lives in the house. There's more than one person in the house and you need to chip in. We need to chip in, guys, to help around the house. Typically speaking, this isn't across the board, but typically speaking, uh, the home has been a little bit of the woman's, the, the wife's domain. And whenever she has been working to really cultivate a home and cultivate a house, uh, sometimes we can come in and we could not only mess up her role of what she's doing, but not take any type of notice or appreciation that we've got clean underwear to wear, or we've got a food, uh, a, a meal prepared for us, or that the counter's been washed. Off. And, and I'm not saying that it's, that's a job of a woman to do all of those things. I'm saying that when your wife is serving you, selflessly serving you, and you take no notice of appreciation of that, but then come home and make other demands of her, it does not equate to a recipe of a successful, healthy, peaceful home. And so men at home, what, you know, I I was talking to Sherry about this, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, if you want to go out on a limb and just try to do something to help, sometimes, uh, and women, maybe you can relate to sometimes, uh, you know, the guy coming home and trying to do dishes, that doesn't really help because they mess up the system that you have in place, you know, when they try to do it themselves. But guys, when you come in and you make the offer to contribute, that's really what matters. It's the fact that you take notice that there's stuff to be done, that the home is not just all placed on one side of the coin. And, and this could go the other way around. Maybe there's a, a, there's a situation where uh, the woman is out at work and the guy's taking care of the home. The, both ways, it works both ways. The appreciation level, the acknowledgement of what it takes to make a home at peace and, 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 to, and to run the day-to-day operations of, of a home and to, and to manage kids. You know, I, you know I, may be at, I may be at work for 50, 60 hour, hours a week week, but when the baby cries at 2 a.m., somebody's got to go address the baby, right? And so a lot of times the woman will take that upon herself and she'll run up there and do that. Do you appreciate that? What can you do to lend a hand? What can you do to acknowledge the fact of the work? Let me tell you, if you're a stay-at-home mom, you have a full-time job. If you're a stay-at-home uh, uh, mom, you have a full-time job. And there are people in this, in, in our, even probably here, that not only have the full-time job of taking care of the home and children, but they also have a job, a 40-hour work week on top of that. And so to come home, men, and expect your wife to take all that responsibility and then continue on, women also need a break and they need space. 
Sometimes it's nice for you to say, hey, I'm going to take the kids for a few hours. You go do your, you go do your own thing, right? You go, take care, you go take care of yourself. Give them some breath of space. Acknowledge the work that's happening to make the home a home. And it's important. It's important. I know that Kevin was mentioning earlier that it's, it's, easy, it's easy for men to uh, try to get away, you know, uh, you know, dive into work, dive into exercise, do hobbies, things that, that kind of take them away from the home. But something that you can do to help them with that is create a peaceful space for them to come home to. I know a lot of women work too, and you guys want a peaceful space too. But I know with the way that men are wired, it's so much easier, at least in, in our marriage and in our home, it's so much easier for Kevin after, if he's had a chaotic day at work, putting out fires all day, and then he comes home and it's chaos at home. The thing that he wants to do is kind of shut down and it makes it very hard for him to engage. But if I can try to create a peaceful environment for him to come home to, then it gives him the space to engage and a space to, uh, to relate to the kids who he has missed all day and, and be able to relate to them and spend time with them and spend time with me because he's not worried about everything that he has to fix in the house as well. I know that, um, don't, don't be over pressured by that too. I know that I, I've grown up where I felt like I had to prove myself and prove that I have, I can do everything by myself. But in history, throughout the Bible, throughout history, women have always had help like neighbors or parents or friends. They, they lived together. They lived in a community where they helped each other. So don't be afraid to ask for help to get things done or to do certain projects to create that house, that peaceful space to where, where when everybody comes home, you can engage. You can be a family. And so mind your favor. Mind your favor, husbands to wives, wives to husbands. Mind your favor. God has given favor uh, in, in the blessing of family and the instructions that he has for how to live as husbands and wives. So moving on from there quickly, children, obey your parents, the Lord, for this is right. All of you are children of someone. You've walked through these shoes. Uh, you've, been, you've been children. And let me tell you something. Here at Springhouse, we have some great kids. And the reason we have great kids is because we have some really pretty fantastic parents. And uh, you're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. The world wants to tell you, tell you to be defeated in parenting your kids uh, to make you feel like you've done a bad job because you've seen something on social media that makes it look like some other family has done something different or better than you have. But let me tell you something, that's a lie from the enemy that causes you to isolate yourself, walk in pity, walk in defeat. That's not true. God has uniquely designed you as a parent to raise your kids. And it is the job of a parent to raise the kid. It's not the job of a teacher or a youth pastor or the relatives. Or it, it is your task and your responsibility as a parent to raise your kid. And what you put around them and who you surround them by makes all the difference in how they're going to be raised. Yes, does it take a village? Absolutely. But I'm in charge of what the village looks like. I'm in charge of who the village uh, is and, and who I'm putting my, my, kid, my kids around. You're doing a good job, parents. Convince yourself that you're doing a good job. Why? Because you can be led by the Holy Spirit in leading your kids. He will give you the conviction that you need and follow that conviction. Not everybody's going to have the same conviction on how, how to raise their, their kids, and that's okay. But the, the Lord will guide you. And specifically in here, it talks about not embittering your children. You know, some of the things that we draw from that is to not humiliate them as you're disciplining them in public. You know, we try, when we discipline our kids, we try to pull them into to private, uh, private and we try to discipline them. Kids need discipline. Kids do need to know the word no. Do you realize that? Yes is not always the answer to everything children need. What happens to a child who gets everything that they want? It does not go good for them. Who's the person who's supposed to provide the no? The parent, right? Right? And so as you're parenting, be intentional with your, with, your, um, with your discipline. And children, when you're obeying your parents, and of course, we don't have a lot of kids in here. It's the first, com- it's the first command we're given with a promise. Uh, and God wants to promise, um, promise uh, give, give these promises and these gifts to, to, to people who will obey. I think the best gift that a, uh, children can give to their parents is to, to obey, uh, even when it's hard and even when it's, when it's unfair. Yeah. Um, go ahead. There's, um, I had the privilege of eating uh, lunch with Yancey, who is a, a Christian song writer and singer for uh, Christian children. 
And, uh, and she was talking about her mom and her, her mom's, her mom will talk to her sons and say, do you know why we obey our parents the first time? It's because it teaches us to obey God the first time when he tells us to do something. And teens, I want to encourage you, it is hard to obey your parents, especially as a teenager, because you're wanting to be your own person, but your parents have been placed in charge over you. And the Bible says, obey your parents because this delights the Lord. In the message version, it says it delights the Lord to no end. If you want to please God, if you love God and you want to please him, it's simple. Just obey your parents, no matter how much you don't want to obey him. And by doing that, you're training yourself to obey God when he gives you something to do later in life and even now. And so we would encourage parents to shepherd, shepherd your, shepherd your kids. Yeah, the, <laughs> there's, there's a sense where, you know, it takes five positive interactions to counteract a negative interaction. And, and we have to discipline our kids because we have to teach them what's right and wrong. The Bible strongly says that if you love your children, you're going to have to discipline them so that you're not responsible for their death. <laughs> but the... <laughs> So you don't Doesn't kill your that. kids. Uh, <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, we have not been called to discipline our children into becoming the person who God had created them to be. We have been called to shepherd our children through green pastures, positive things to become the person that God created them to be and to use our shepherd hook, not to, not to bang them over the head and say, well, you messed up. No, it's to, it's to gently guide them back to that path that God wants them to be on. And so, yes, we have to discipline, but it's also be mindful that you're, you're countering that with and preceding it with positive things, being in their lives, talking with them. Don't just always discipline. You have to have that positive side. Parenting is rarely convenient, right, parents? Rarely is it convenient. Uh, but boy, it's one of the most rewarding gifts that we've been giving. Mind your favor. Mind your favor when it comes to your kids and the ability and the blessing it is to raise a family. All of this, guys, husbands to wives, wives to husbands, raising kids and the interactions, all of this is a mirror of what our relationship is supposed to be with the Lord. What's your relationship with the Lord? How does he treat us? How do we treat him? All of this is a practice in submitting to one another, yes, but also walking in submission and being to the Lord and being covered by him. As the band comes and we close out today, I just want to read from the message translation, uh, verses 15 through 17 of Colossians and how we open, which says this, let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other and step with each other. None of this is going off. None of this going off and doing your own thing and cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing, sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. Family is a beautiful thing. Family is a beautiful thing. And it was God's idea and it was God's design. And so we'll follow these instructions. If we'll lean on him, if we'll trust him, if we'll involve him, then man, we'll have fruitful families. And we do have fruitful families because I do see the Holy Spirit active in the families of the lives here at Spring House. Are we gonna mess it up sometimes? Yep. Working on a B right now, trying to climb to an A minus, okay, right here, all right? But boy, I'm so glad I got a partner with me who can gently point me to the Lord. And I'm glad that the Lord cares enough about me and my kids that he will gently guide me into greener pastures growing together in him. Y'all stand, let's sing together. The Lord has blessings for our families as we lean into him. Let's lead, let's sing.